Hey, let's get started. So, um, thanks for coming and uh, braving the weather for this last day before spring break. So, you just have to endure me for this one lecture, and then you get a week off. So, maybe all the rain will be gone by next week, and we'll have a sunny spring break. That would be nice. Um, so remember, you've got uh, at least one duty here to do before spring break, uh, and that is uh, finishing this homework assignment um, uh, where you're going to apply that uh, uh, definition, that limit definition of differentiation. Um, by the way, that's the process. Uh, 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 that's what that process is called when you're finding the rate of change function or the derivative function. Remember, those uh, terms are interchangeable. So that process is called differentiation. Um, and so uh, in this homework, um, you're going to apply that uh, limit definition to carry out the different, uh, differentiation uh, process. Okay, uh, And so that's a little bit tedious, all right? Uh, but um, uh, the good thing about today's lecture is um, uh, once you have endured that uh, tedium a few times, uh, then um, I'm going to show you today uh, some shortcut rules for differentiation. Okay, So this is a good lecture because I'm going to make your life uh, a little bit easier and you'll be able to find uh, rate of change functions uh, m uh, much faster um, uh, uh, after today, Okay, at least for certain types of functions. And then uh, as we uh, continue, we'll learn uh, more of these uh, shortcut rules that will allow you to differentiate uh, a bigger variety of uh, functions. So that's really the focus of uh, today's lecture. All right. So uh, and that's the focus of this homework uh, 3.1, uh, which is due after uh, spring break. OK. And, and then this test review quiz. Remember, that's just a it's not a quiz. Just a test review homework. That is an extra credit assignment. Uh, also due after uh, spring break. All right. Uh, and so uh, that kind of brings us um, up to date on where we are. I'm uh, taping things. So uh, as usual. So this um, lecture will be available uh, for you to uh, if you need it for uh, during spring break. And um, I'll get it posted. Uh, it will be a little bit late getting posted because I'm leaving town right after class today. But um, um, so it won't be until I get where I'm going that I'll be able to upload uh, this lecture. But you've got plenty of time, I guess, over spring break to look at it if you need to, uh, to review these differentiation rules before you uh, do this homework 3.1. Okay. All right. So um, um, do you have some questions here? Uh, about these problems in 2.3. So we looked at some examples of applying this limit definition last time, but um, I know it, uh, it's not conceptually difficult, really. Well, maybe it is, okay? But the algebra can be especially challenging, so um, um, that's usually the hard part, all right? And that's why you need some practice with uh, going through this uh, uh, limit process. Do you have any questions o over that? Which one, number four? OK, so um, that's probably a good uh, example to look at. Let me open it. <laughs> Which one? Three? OK. Uh, well, they're very similar, actually. So uh, uh, right. So if you've, uh, they're not exactly the same, but uh, almost identical. So if you can do three, you can do four, I think. Um, or vice versa. So, uh, so let's look at that. Oh, oh no, they're not exactly similar. Actually, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, there's a di there is a difference between the two. Okay, um, in the in number three, they're asking you to find the value of the derivative at a particular input value. Okay, but in number four, they're asking you to actually find a formula for the derivative function uh, itself, right, that you could use to find the derivative at any input value, OK? So here, uh, uh, we're looking for just the rate of change at the input 2. 
Here, we're finding a formula for the rate of change so that we can apply that formula and find the rate of change at any any input, any given input, not just two, right? Okay. So, but the uh, the process is very similar, okay, uh, in the two problems. So actually, let's do number three, but we'll do it in the style of four, okay? All right. So that we'll sort of kill two birds with uh, one stone here. All right. Um, in a sense, that's a terrible metaphor. We'll uh, plant two trees with one seed, okay? Um, I don't want to talk about killing birds um, right here before spring break. All right, so uh, y'all write that down for me. So, uh, Zena, your problem may be slightly different than this one, okay, because these are randomly generated. But um, so, uh, so, but my problem is G of T is T squared plus 9T minus 7, and we want to find uh, the rate of change at the input T equal 2. All right, so um, let me find some... Uh, uh, let me find some blank paper here that I can work on. All right, so here's a blank sheet. All right, so the the formula was G of T was what? T squared, what? Plus 9T minus 7. And what they're asking us to find is the rate of change at the input 2. In other words... Um, uh, G prime of uh, 2, okay? Um, now, they have thrown a little bit of a, uh, a, a switch here on us because they're using T as the input variable rather than X, but that's uh, really unimportant, okay, uh, to what we're getting ready to do. Uh, I do want to show you once, uh, I do want to show you another notation for um, uh, uh, that rate of change at the input 2, and this is kind of archaic notation, um, uh, this uh, calculus was invented prior to the invention of modern function notation. So this is modern function notation. So we're using function notation here to, input, uh, to indicate the rate of change at the input 2. Not g of 2, but the rate of change at the input 2. That's what the prime means, of course, right? But another uh, way of uh, indicating the rate of change at the input 2 uh, is um, a little bit older, but it looks like this, but it's still in use, okay, because it's actually convenient in uh, 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 certain cases. So uh, this is this so-called D notation. So what you would do is take, uh, you would write dy, okay, I'm assuming here y is the output variable, okay, it, we don't really have an output variable indicated here, but I'm going to assume it's y. So you would write dy over, it looks like a fraction, but it's really not a fraction, and then you would write d and then the input variable, okay? So uh, if you see that d notation, that uh, uh, almost inevitably means a rate of change. And we're trying to find the rate of change at the input 2. So, uh, so in this notation, what we do is we put this long vertical bar next to the dy over dt, and then we write uh, t equals 2, okay? So you can see that's kind of clumsy notation. It's not nearly as clean as modern function notation like this, right? But it means the same thing. This means the rate of change at uh, the input 2. But I want to show that to you because it comes up sometimes in the, uh, uh, in the homework problem. So when you see that, you don't want to be thrown off by wondering, what in the world are they asking for? They're just asking here for the rate of change at uh, the input uh, two. Okay. All right. So to calculate that, though, no matter what notation you're using to indicate that rate of change, you will use that limit uh, definition, right? So we would do the limit as h uh, approaches zero, right? Okay. The limit is h approaches zero of g of two, since they want the rate of change at the input two plus h, right? Minus g of 2 over uh, 2 plus h minus 2, okay? So that's the setup for the, um, that's the setup for the problem. So you would have to evaluate g of 2 plus h, you would evaluate g of 2, right? Do the subtraction in the numerator, of course, in the denominator, that's going to be h. You would try to simplify this fraction and then think about what's happening 
to whatever quantity you get when you simplify this fraction, think about what's happening to that quantity as h approaches 0. Okay? All right, so that's what they were really intending for you to do in this problem. All right? But now I'm going to actually uh, uh, do something a little bit more general. Let's actually find the formula for uh, g prime for any input t, not just uh, for the input 2, but for any number that we would choose here to find the rate of change for, okay? All right, so I'm going to go through uh, 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 the same process, okay? But it'll be a little bit, uh, by, when I get my result, it, my answer, it'll be a little bit more powerful because I'll be able to use that answer to find the rate of change, not just at the input 2, but at any input that I uh, care to find the rate of change at, okay? And, and again, notationally, the way you would indicate this is, uh, dy over dt. You wouldn't uh, uh, write the vertical bar here because uh, uh, what we're going to find is a formula here that you can use to find the rate of change at any input. So you don't have to specify a specific input uh, uh, when you find this formula. All right. So these two things mean the same thing. This is the rate of change formula. This also means the rate of change uh, formula. Okay. So you put d the input uh, the output variable in the top and then d, the input variable in the bottom in this sort of old-fashioned uh, notation, all right? Well, again, how do we do this now? So we're going to take the limit as h approaches 0 of g of, now instead of using 2, right, you're going to use just the variable t. So it would be g of t plus h minus g of t, okay, over t plus h minus t, right? So instead of using the specific value for a, a, a 2 for the input variable t here, we will just keep the uh, input variable t. Go ahead and try to simplify this uh, fraction using algebra, right? See what we get, and then think about what's going to happen to that uh, quantity as h approaches 0. And what we'll end up with is, hopefully, if we do this right, we'll end up with a formula involving t and that formula will uh, uh, allow us to find the rate of change for any value of t, not just uh, uh, you know the specific value two. Okay, so that's what they're asking you to do in problems four and five. Okay, is find a formula for the rate of change in in the first uh, in problems two and three. They were asking you to actually find the rate of change at a particular input. Once we find this formula, we can go back and figure out what uh, g prime of 2 exactly is, okay? Um, all right, so let's carry this out, all right? So let's see, um, well, I've just got to do the, I've got to do the arithmetic here, right? So I have the limit as h approaches 0 of, let's see, what is g of t plus h. I need to look at that. So that's going to be what? Um, t plus h squared, right? Plus 9 times t plus h minus 7, right? Okay. Just plug in t plus h into your formula for t, right? And then you're subtracting off. So that's just g of t plus h. And then we're subtracting off g of t. Don't forget, you want to subtract off the whole thing now, right? So what's g of t? Well, we know what that is, right? That's just uh, t squared plus 9t minus 7, okay? And then, of course, the denominator, well, we can simplify that immedi immediately because t plus h minus t is uh, h. And at this point now, this is where, you know, you're sort of depressed, right? Because you're thinking, okay, I have to uh, now carry out all this arithmetic. I've got a square t plus h. Uh, I've got to multiply t plus h times 9. I've got to subtract 7. Then I've got to subtract all of this, right? Okay. So we do have a little bit of work to do here. But um, it's all uh, 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 not that bad, okay, if we just um, get started on it, right? Okay. So... Let's start here. I'll talk like uh, your grandmother. Uh, uh, well begun is half done, right? Okay, so once we get started, then um, it won't seem so bad. So let's see. T plus H is um, squared is T plus H times T plus H, right? And then what's 9 times T plus H? That's uh, 9T plus 9H, right? 
minus 7. Don't forget the minus 7. It's easy to drop terms here because there are a lot of terms involved in the numerator. So it's easy to um, uh, be careless and drop terms. So you want to try to avoid that. But you'll probably notice if that happens, because if you start dropping terms, what will happen is when you get down after you've simplified all of this, um, it's not going to work out to a nice answer. Okay. Uh, all right, now let's subtract off the t squared plus 9t minus 7. Well, that's just a matter of changing all the signs, right? So I have minus t squared minus 9t and then plus 7. All of that divided by h, okay? All right, so now let's multiply t plus h times t plus h. So t times t is t squared. t times h is um, ht. And then we have ht again. And then we have h times h is h squared. And then the, that 9t plus the 9h minus the 7 minus the t squared minus the 9t plus the 7, right? All of this divided by h. And now at this point, if you want to, right at this point, you can go ahead and add these two terms together. But uh, 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 but at the same time you're adding those two, those are like terms, so you can add those two terms together, right? But at the same time you're adding those two terms together, now you can start um, uh, 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 canceling things, right? Because notice a bunch of things in the numerator cancel, and that's exactly what should happen here. So you shouldn't feel guilty about this, okay? T squared minus T squared, that's going to go away, right? And then you have a minus 7 and a plus 7, right? So... Um, so those two terms go away, see? So a lot of the terms cancel. And now let's add, let's combine our like terms. So we have uh, how many HTs here? That's two of them, is that right? We have a plus 9T and a minus 9T. Oh. See, I was a little pessimistic there, right? Okay. Even more terms cancel. The more terms cancel, the better, okay? So, because uh, uh, that's just going to make our life easier, right? So we have HT plus HT, so that's um, 2HT, right? And then uh, plus the H squared, and then uh, plus the 9H, that didn't cancel, did it? All of that over H. And now something really nice happens because we still have that H in the denominator, but now we notice, ah, what a relief because we can divide h into each of the terms in the numerator, right? h goes into this term, h goes into this term, and h goes into this term. So you can answer, actually divide out that h that's in the denominator, and that's exactly what has to happen. If that doesn't happen, you're in trouble, okay? So if you cannot divide out that h in the denominator, you know something has gone wrong, right? But when you divide that out, what are we left with? Um, 2t, right, plus h plus 9, and now we've got it right where we want it, okay? Because now we can think about, okay, here I have this quantity, 2t plus h plus 9, okay? What's going to happen to that quantity as h gets really, really small? So as h becomes infinitesimally small, right, very, very close to 0, what's going to happen to this quantity? Well, nothing happens to the first term because that first term doesn't have anything to do with h, right? Nothing happens to the last term because that term doesn't have anything to do with h. But what happens to the middle term? Essentially what? It goes away, right? It disappears, right? Because as, as h gets very small, this term is going to become insignificant, right? So ultimately, what you're going to get left with here is just 2t plus Nine. There it is. Okay, that's what you want. All right. So, Zinni, do you understand what that is? That is a formula now that you can use to find the rate of change at any input, right? Okay, not just the input two, right? But at any input, all you do is plug that input into that formula. So, there it is. There's your formula. It's 2t plus 9. And so now, once we have that formula, then so easy now. Now we can find g prime of 2. It's just 2 times 2 plus 9, right? So it's what, 13? Yeah, okay. That's what we would have found, by the way, if we had evaluated this limit. We would have come out to eventually just 13, okay? <clears throat> yeah? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> okay. Um, that is a good question. Um, uh, I'm chuckling a little bit because this is exactly the issue that's going to happen on the next test, okay? Because um, uh, I'm getting ready today to show you some shortcut rules that you can follow to find these rate of change uh, uh, formulas much easier than going than evaluating the limit, you see, okay? And once you, of course, once you find those shortcut formulas, you're not going to want to uh, 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 use the uh, this process, right, to... Uh, you know, find the rate of change, okay? But I will have to ask you on the test to carry out this process. So I'll probably say, um, you know, here's a, here's a function. Uh, I, you can easily figure out that the rate of change formula must look like this, right, by using the shortcut rules. But I need you to verify for me that that is the correct formula by going through the steps of the limit process, okay? So, yeah, so you will be asked to carry out this process um, uh, on the test, right? Okay, not not min not uh, very much because that each one takes a long time, right? Okay, all right, but um, at least once, okay? Yeah. I just have trouble from the first step. How do you go from the first step to the second step? Here to here? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're looking at the function formula, right? Yeah. So there's the original, make sure you're looking at the original function formula. And so to calculate g of t plus h, I've got to take all of t plus h. Let me draw it for you. I've got to take all of t plus h, right? And I've got to plug it in to the formula for t, okay? So I have to plug it in there, and I have to plug it in there, right? So what would I plug that in up here? What does that give me? That gives me t plus h squared, right? And then 9 times t plus h, but see, this term didn't have a t in it, so that just stays the same. You just have minus 7. And then you subtract off, right, g of t, but you know what g of t is because that's what the formula is telling you directly, right? Okay? See, if I plug t into this formula for t, I'm going to get the same thing again, right? Okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so so uh, so that's it. Okay, there we have a formula now for the rate of change of t squared plus 9t uh, minus uh, 7. Okay, and now I can do all sorts of things with that. Um, where is it? There it is. So now I can do all sorts of things with that rate of change uh, formula. Okay, all right. <clears throat> In particular, I can find the rate of change at any input. Whatsoever. So if I ask you, you know, what's the in, what's the rate of change at zero? You're not going to go back and try to do this, right? You're just going to say, oh, the rate of change at zero, uh, that must be uh, the rate of change at zero. Oh, that must be two times zero plus nine. That must be nine, right? Okay. Because I know it, it I can get it from this formula. Or if I wanted to know the rate of change at minus one, oh yeah, that must be two times minus one. Uh, uh, sorry, plus 9, which is 7, okay, right? So now, once you've got that formula, these rates of change are just trivial to calculate, right? You don't have to, for this particular formula, you don't have to use the limit ever again, okay, uh, to find the rate of change. All right. So try applying that limit um, process in those problems in uh, homework 2.3, okay? Now, uh, that homework 2.3 is not due until tonight, and but today I'm going to show you some shortcuts, okay? So you will be very, now after today, it will be very easy for you to tell whether uh, uh, you uh, did the limit process right on those problems in homework 2.3, okay? Because I'm going to show you the shortcuts, all right? And... Um, so you'll know if your answers that you get without even, you know, uh, clicking the button in WebAssign, you're going to know whether your answers are uh, correct or not. Okay, um, before we do that, though, uh, I want to finish up with um, one example uh, that we were looking at um, uh, last time. Okay, so we had the formula, the function x squared plus 2x and we found the formula for its rate of change function, 
by the way, which is also called the derivative function. All right. So the formula for the rate of change function for x squared plus 2x happens to turn out, interestingly enough, to be 2x plus 2. And we derived that last time exactly the same way we did in that example that we just did. Okay. We went through the limit process, and we found that here's the formula for the rate of change uh, function. Okay. It's 2x plus 2. So I can use that formula now to find the rate of change at any value x that I like for this particular function. Okay, for this particular function, any value x that I want to find the rate of change for, I can just by plugging that x value into this formula 2x plus 2. By the way, again, the alternate notation for this is dy over dx. That also means the rate of change uh, formula. Okay. So let's look at uh, a couple more parts to this problem. So it says, use the formula for the rate of change that we just found. Remember, that was 2x plus 2. Let me write it down again. Okay. So we found that f prime of x was 2x plus 2. Okay. So it says, use that formula now to find, what are they asking for here? So this is that archaic ancient notation, right? So what are we asking for here? Yeah, the rate of change at zero, right? Okay. So if we were using modern function notation, not this old-fashioned notation, we would express that as f prime of f prime of zero, the rate of change at zero. Well, how do we find that now? That's so easy, right? Because now we know the formula for the rate of change, right? It's two x plus two, correct? So I just take two times zero plus two, and I get two, okay? Ah, so see, see how easy that was? Once you found the rate of change formula, then these rates of change are just, they're easy to uh, uh, determine now, right? Okay, so this rate of change formula is a great labor-saving device once you have discovered it, right? Okay, so I know the rate of change at zero is two. So what does that tell me about what's happening to the function f at the input zero? That's the next question. So the next question says, hmm, is the function f, is it increasing or decreasing at x equals 0? It's increasing, right? Why do I know that? Because the rate of change is 2, right? And 2 is a positive number, OK? See, 2 is a positive number, correct, right? So that tells me that if I were to make a graph of the function f, it's going to be going up at the input 0, because the rate of change was positive at the input 0, OK? So the answer here is increasing, right? OK, just what y'all told me, right? Because the rate of change is uh, positive. Let's find the rate of change at negative 2. Let's find the rate of change at negative 2. So again, that's so easy, right? We just apply our uh, formula. So f prime of minus 2 was what? 2 times? Um, Minus 2 plus 2, right? Remember, that was the rate of change function was um, 2x plus 2, right? So the rate of change at minus 2 is going to be uh, 2 times minus 2 plus 2. And that works out to be uh, negative 2, I think. Okay. So what's the answer to the second part of the question? Is the function f, it, we don't have a graph of f, so we can't see this, but we don't have to see it, right? Is f going up or going down at the input minus 2? Which direction? Going down, right, because the rate of change was less than 0, right? Okay, the rate of change is less than 0. So if I made a graph of the function f, okay, then I would see it's somehow going down at this particular x value. Let's keep going with this example. So without graphing, without graphing, all right, find the values of x where the tangent line is horizontal. So for this particular function, remember the function was, um, I forgot what the formula for the function was. We have to go all the way back to the beginning. We forgot that. It was x squared plus 2x. So the original formula for the function was x squared plus 2x. And the formula for the rate of change was 2x plus 2. Okay. 
So that's the original function formula. That's the rate of change formula, right? But it's asking us now without graphing, where on this graph, the original graph, where is the tangent line horizontal? Okay, so if you were to make a graph of x squared plus 2x, where would the tangent line be horizontal? Without graphing and looking, how could we answer that question just from this information? Well, the tangent line is horizontal means, what about, what's the slope of horizontal lines? Zero, right. So what we're trying to figure out is where is the rate of change zero, right? Where is the rate of change zero? So take your rate of change formula and just set it equal to zero. Take the rate of change formula, not the original function formula, but the rate of change formula, and set it to zero and try to figure out what x values give you a rate of change of zero. That's not a hard equation to solve at all, right? I can solve that. I just, what, subtract 2 from both sides? So I get 2x is minus 2, or x is equal to what? Negative 1. Ah, okay. So that tells me, oh, at when x is minus 1, the um, tangent line is horizontal. The tangent line is horizontal. <clears throat> Let's verify that. So um, let's, um, we may have verified this last time, but let's do it again. So, shoot. So let's actually graph the function, what was it, x squared plus 2x? Not the rate of change function, but the, um, the original function. Graph that. So x squared plus... Uh, plus 2x, there's the graph, not a very complicated graph, and where is the tangent line horizontal? Ah, right there, right, okay, and where is that? That's right at x equals minus 1, see, okay, so, but we can find that without even looking at the graph now, right, okay, we can, uh, 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 because we know that the rate of change is 0, the rate of change is zero right here at x equals minus one. Okay. By the way, now that happened to be a um, a valley turning point, right? That happens to be a valley turning point. So you can see that from the graph, right? That's where the uh, that's where the graph reaches a local minimum, right? Okay. Uh, so that's a valley turning point. But could we have figured that out? Uh, could we have figured that out without looking at the graph? So we know there's some sort of turning point right here at x equals minus 1, right? Because that's where the tangent line is horizontal. We figure that out. But could we have, without looking at the graph, could we have figured out if that was a, um, a local maximum or a local minimum? I claim that, um, I claim that you could have, OK? And here's why, all right? So here's why. We already discovered that f prime of uh, 0 was positive, right? Didn't we discover that just a moment ago? Let's go back up here. Yeah. We discovered that f prime of 0 was positive, correct? Right. But we also discovered a moment ago that f prime of 2 I'm sorry, was it 2? No. f prime of minus 2, we discovered that f prime of minus 2 was negative, right? Remember that? There's f prime of minus 2. So I know that f prime of minus 2 is negative, all right? So we know here at 0, the function is increasing, but at minus 2, the function was decreasing, right? So at 0, the function was increasing, but at minus 2, the function is decreasing. So that means what must have happened? See, at minus 2, it's decreasing, but at 0, it was increasing, right? See, at minus 2, it was decreasing, but at 0, it was increasing. See, it was at zero, it's increasing. At minus two, it's decreasing. So what happened? What had to happen somewhere between minus two and zero? How are you going to connect these two pieces? 
if you've got a decreasing piece and an increasing piece, if you're going to connect those two pieces, what has to happen? you got to have a turning point, right? Okay, don't you? Okay, if it's decreasing here at minus 2 and increasing over here at 0, the only way that can happen is if you have a turning point, right, in between them, correct? Okay, but we know where that turning point is. Where is that turning point? At negative 1, okay? So, Zaman, what sort of turning point did that have to be? Had to be a minimum, correct? Okay, if it's decreasing and then switching to increasing, the only way that's going to happen is if it turns around somewhere between minus 2 and 0. I know where it turns around. It has to turn around at minus 1 because that's where the tangent line is horizontal. So I do know that minus 1 has to be a minimum, right? Okay, minus 1 has to be a minimum. So, look, this is really powerful. See, you can figure out lots of things about the shape of a graph without actually having to make the graph, okay, just by looking at the rate of change formula. Just by looking at the rate of change formula, you can discover lots of things about the graph of a function without actually having to draw the graph, okay? That was very powerful uh, uh, information uh, uh, especially before graphing calculators, okay, right, okay, because it was hard to make graphs uh, uh, in days before graphing calculators, but, uh, 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 right, that was hard to do, that was clumsy and tedious to do, but it wasn't necessary to do that because you could find out a lot of information about what the graph was going to look like without actually having to construct the graph. Okay, all right, finally now, well, I think we've just got time. All right, so finish with that example. And finally, now let's get on to the main um, fun stuff for today. Which is, what are the shortcut rules for, what are the shortcut rules for finding rate of change functions without having to go through all of that um, limit process okay all right so I've got four rules I'm going to show you today and these will apply in many many cases not every case though okay but they will apply in lots of cases to allow you to find a rate of change formula and I think all of the examples in the homework 3.1 you'll be able to apply one of these rules or a combination of these rules to find uh, the rate of change formula for a given function um, without having to go through the limit process, okay? Um, the first one is really easy. This is called the constant rule, all right? Uh, and it's, it's good to remember sometimes the, the names of these rules because the names of the rules uh, uh, can actually suggest something about the rule itself, okay? So if you don't want to memorize the rule in, symb in symbolic form, if you just remember the name of the rule, that can really help you remember how the rule works, okay? So here's what the constant rule says. If you have a function formula that's a very simple formula, it's just a constant. So you, if you just have the uh, 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 f of x is equal to a number, okay, right, and you don't have the variable involved in the formula, you just have f of x is equal to a constant, right, then the rate of change for that type of formula is easy. It's zero, Okay, the rate of change is zero. Now, why is that true? Okay, look, it's obvious uh, why that uh, uh, is true. Okay, because if you have a formula that is a constant, it's never changing, correct? Okay, the output is always the same, right? No matter what input you use, you always get the same output. So that means there is no change. So the rate of change has to be zero, okay? I mean, intuitively, that's just got to be the case, right? So the rate of change for a constant is zero. I, here's how I put that. Um, there's the name of that uh, formula. It's the constant rule. Here's how I put that into words. The derivative of a constant function is zero, okay? So that's the simplest rule of all. But that one, you, you get to apply that one a lot, okay? So even though it's a simple rule... Uh, doesn't mean it's not useful, all right? 
Okay, here's the second one. Here's the one that's really powerful. This is really the most powerful uh, differentiation rule of all, okay? Um, it's called the power rule, okay? So if you have a function that looks like this, all right, where you just have the input variable raised to a power, and the power can be any number at all, okay? It doesn't have to be a whole number. It does not have to be a whole number. This power can also be a fraction. This is what Newton discovered, okay? This power can also be a fraction, right? But, but the formula has to look like this, an in, the input variable raised to a power. Then here is what the rate of change formula is always going to look like, okay? So again, this is called the power rule. I don't have a good English language version of the power rule, okay? Uh, it's too hard to describe this in words, but here's how it works, all right? What you'll do is, to find the rate of change formula, you're going to take the exponent, whatever it is, it can be anything other than zero, okay? You, you bring it down as a coefficient in front, okay? So you bring that um, exponent down in front as a coefficient, right? And then you just subtract one from the exponent, okay? Just subtract one from the exponent. That's the formula. That's just that easy. That's the formula for the rate of change. Okay. So for any uh, a, 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 a formula that looks like this, that's what the rate of change is always going to look like. Hmm. Now we need to see some examples of that. Okay. But that's what you want to remember. Bring down the exponent. Bring down the exponent and subtract one from it. All right, now the next one is called the multiple rule. And what the multiple rule says is the following, okay? Uh, if you have a function that's just a constant multiplied times an expression, to find the rate of change, you really can just ignore the constant. Just find the rate of change of the expression, okay? The constant will just remain in the rate of change formula. Now, you might say, isn't that the same as the, that's not the same as the constant rule. Yeah, it's not the same as the constant rule because uh, I, I'm not saying that the function is a constant. I'm saying the function is a constant times some expression. So a number times some expression, okay? Then to find the rate of change, just find the rate of change of that expression and the constant will remain in the rate of change formula. Okay, just as it appeared in the original function formula. All right, and finally, the last rule is called the sum rule. This one is also very powerful. When you write the sum rule down in, uh, in symbolically, it looks kind of complicated, but in practice, it's really easy. What this says is, suppose you have a function okay, that, uh, is, that is the sum of terms, or it could be the difference. It doesn't matter if this is plus or minus, all right? So you have a function, and it's got two terms. It actually could be two or three or four uh, many terms, okay, right? Then to find the rate of change formula, just find the rate of change of each of the terms, okay? So uh, 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 if you've got a function that's the sum of two expressions, to find the rate of change, just find the um, uh, rate of change of each of the uh, things that are, that, is, that are added or subtracted together. Here's how you say that in words. It, get, it comes out really nicely in English. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Okay? The derivative of a, sum, of a sum, just take the sum of the derivatives. That's all. All right, now we've got to see some examples of those so that it makes sense, okay? But when you see them in practice, they really work really nicely. So let's start first with the constant rule. So suppose you start with this very simple function, f of x equals minus 12. So notice your formula is just a constant, right? Just a constant, just a number, right? So it doesn't involve x at all, okay? There's your formula for your function. Then the constant rule says, wow, that is so easy to differentiate, right? So easy to find the rate of change for that. What is, let me see if I can write it down right. All 
So what is the rate of change of that function? Zero, right, yeah. The constant rule says rate of change there is just going to be zero, okay? If you have a function formula that's very simple, it's just a constant, then the rate of change always turns out to be zero, okay? What about here's another constant function? That is a constant function. Pi is a number, right? Okay, that's not a variable, all right? That's a number. Remember, pi is approximately 3.14157 something. It's something, right? Okay. So if I want to find the rate of change of that formula, it's just going to be what? Zero, yeah, okay. The rate of change of a constant is just zero always, okay? So if you have just a pure number, right, doesn't have a variable in it, then its rate of change, so simple, just works out to be zero. Now, you're going to say, well, gee, how often do I come across easy functions like this? That doesn't happen very often in practice. Yeah, no, it doesn't, okay? Uh, 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 you, you don't run across easy functions like this very often in practice. But remember, um, uh, 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 you may have constants in the formulas of more complicated functions, and, and the, the rate of change of those uh, terms is going to be zero. So actually, this is a very useful rule, okay? It's actually probably the rule that, uh, uh, along with the power rule, that's applied most often when you're trying to find a rate of change formula. All right, now this is not a constant function. This is not a constant function. Y equals x squared, right? Okay, so that's x squared is not a number, right? That actually has the variable in it. And so now I want to find its rate of change, okay? How would we denote its rate of change? Oh, you could denote it as, uh, you could write f prime of x if you want to, even though I didn't give a name to this function. So if you want to write down f prime of x, that's fine. Or you could use that old-fashioned notation. So you could write dy dx here. Or you could also just write the output variable, y, and put a prime above that. Any of those is acceptable. They all mean the rate of change. So what's the rate of change of x squared? That's where the power rule is going to come in, okay? Because see, there you just have the input variable x raised to a power. So according to the power rule, how do I find that rate of change? Ooh, let's scroll back up there and remind ourselves. What does the power rule say? What do you do? Drop the exponent and what? Subtract 1. Drop the exponent and subtract 1. So let's see, drop that exponent down and subtract one from it. So bring the two down in front as a coefficient and subtract one from it. Of course, what's two minus one? That's one. So you have two x to the first power here. What's x to the first power though? No, no, x to the zeroth power is zero, but x to the first power is Usually you would just write x, right? Okay, you wouldn't write the exponent. So you can just write the answer here as 2x. There's the rate of change formula. It's just 2x. So rate of change of x squared is 2x. So if I were to go through the limit process, you know, with this function x squared to find the rate of change function, here's what I would end up with at the end of all that uh, uh, algebra. I would end up with just plain old 2x. That's what the power rule tells me. Isn't that nice? By the way, what if, uh, I don't have this example, but what if um, f of x is just plain x? So what's the rate of change of x? Well, keep in mind, x is the same as x to the first power, right? You don't normally write the exponent in that case, but it, that does mean X does mean X to the first power. So there you can apply the power rule. So you can apply the power rule. So the power rule says you bring down the one, right, in front. That's kind of meaningless, but you're supposed to bring the one down in front as a coefficient. And then what do you do? Subtract one from the exponent. So you end up with one times X to the zeroth power. And now you all tell me, what's X to the zeroth power? What? Not zero. One, yeah. Remember, when you raise a quantity to the zeroth power, 
to raise it to the zeroth power, not multiply it by zero. But when you raise it to the zeroth power, you get one, right? So what we end up here with is a very simple formula. That's just one times one, which is one. Oh, how nice. Okay. So the rate of change of x is just one. Okay. By the way, we could have figured that out intuitively without knowing this rule because this is a linear function. X is a linear function. And so uh, you know its rate of change is the same as its slope. And what's the slope of X? It's one, you see. Okay. So that perfectly agrees with what we already knew. All right. Ah. Is this easier than using the limit? Or y'all want to go back to the limit? I didn't think so. Okay, all right, yeah, all right. Now, here's where it really gets fun, all right, okay? Because, again, the power rule applies to any power at all. The power does not have to be a whole number, does not have to be a whole number. So this is what, this is what uh, Newton discovered, okay? Uh, one of the many things Newton discovered, okay? So, yeah, so you're looking at square root of x and you're thinking, mm, how am I going to find the rate of change formula for square root of x? That does not look like the power rule. But it really does use the power rule because you can rewrite square root of x as an exponent. How do you write square root of x with an exponent? It's x to the half. So finally, you see, you, you guys were wondering, why do I ever care about writing square root of x as an exponent, okay? Who cares, right? Why not just write it as square root of x? Here's where it's really useful, all right? So to find the rate of change of square root of x, think of square root of x as x to the one-half power. And then you can apply the power rule. So you can write one-half, bring the exponent down, times x to the one-half minus one. What's one half minus one? That's negative one half. So there is the rate of change formula. It's one half times x to the minus one half power. Now let's rewrite that in terms of roots. So x to the minus one half power would be one over x to the one half power, right? Because isn't that how you deal with negative exponents? You take the reciprocal. So uh, x to the minus 1 half power is 1 over x to the 1 half power. And we just said, and what's another way of writing x to the 1 half power? Square root, right, okay? So you can write this as 1 half times 1 over the square root of x, and that ends up as 1 over 2 square root of x. Ah, cool, okay? So... If your function is square root of x, its rate of change formula, believe it or not, okay, is 1 over 2 times the square root of x. 1 over 2 times the square root of x. By the way, one mistake that you'll want to make right, that it's easy to make right here, is when you have 1 half times x to the minus 1 half power, the 1 half is not raised to the minus 1 half power. Right? It's just the x that's raised to the minus 1 half power. So when you flip that x to the minus 1 half power, don't flip the 1 half. Okay? Just leave that written as 1 half. So you have 1 half times 1 over x to the 1 half. Not, don't flip the 1 half. Okay? If you wanted the 1 half also raised to the minus 1 half power, you would have to have this in parentheses. Okay? But it's not. So... Be careful about that. That's an easy algebra mistake to make. All right, so suppose our function is x to the minus 3, okay? x to the minus 3, and I want to find the rate of change function. There's the power rule again. There's the power rule again, because, again, it doesn't matter what that power is. As long as it's not 0, it cannot be 0, okay? It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be a fraction, you can still use the power rule. So to find the rate of change formula, it's the same process. Bring down the exponent, 
So bring down the minus 3 and do what? One. Subtract 1, right, subtract 1. So you get minus 3 times x to the minus 4. That's it. There's your rate of change uh, formula. Now, you might say right here, uh, Dr. Waller, I can do something with x to the minus 4 power. Because I know that x to the minus 4 power means the same as 1 over x to the 4th power. And that is correct. So you can eventually rewrite this as um, minus 3 over x to the 4th power. See, x to the minus 4 means 1 over x to the positive 4. Don't, it's not minus, the, the minus 3 is not raised to the minus 4, by the way, okay? It's just the x. So leave the minus 3 alone. So x to the minus 4 is 1 over x to the 4th power, and then multiply those two things back together. So you get minus 3 over x to the 4th power. That is the same thing as this, okay? So that also is the correct answer. Um, however, this answer I would leave written like this. This is not incorrect, so this is all right. But I would leave the answer written like this because the original formula had a negative exponent in it. So I would try to make the rate of change formula look like the original formula. Okay. So since the original formula had x to the minus 3, I would just leave that as x to the minus 4. I wouldn't bother th with this step. Okay. That's just kind of a formality. All right, let's look at this one. 5 over x squared. The, how am I going to take the how am I going to take the rate of change there? You're going to be really tempted to do the following, but don't do it. You're going to be really tempted to write that this is the rate of change is 5 over and then bring the 2 down and subtract 1 from it in the numerator, okay? Because that looks like that should be the right answer. And then you end up there with, you're going to end up with 5 over 2x. Because x to the 1 is just x, right? So that's very tempting, but that is incorrect. In fact, it's wildly incorrect, okay? You cannot apply the power rule if the, uh, if the uh, 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 term is in the denominator. You have to make sure that the term you're applying the power rule is out of the denominator. So how can I rewrite 5 over x squared? How can I rewrite that? Uh, not negative 5x squared, but you got the right idea, Zaman. It's 5x to the what? Yeah, 5x to the minus 2, right? Okay, so that's the a step you want to take first before you apply the power rule, okay? So to bring that x out of the denominator, rewrite it with a negative exponent. Now you can apply the power rule. So you, it's not really costing you much. Now you can apply the power rule. So you bring the minus 2 down. Just leave the 5, okay? Just leave the 5. Nothing happens to the 5. And then times x to the what power? Negative 2 minus 1. Okay? Subtract 1. So you end up here with minus 10. Minus 2 times 5 is minus 10. x to the minus 3. Now, it, so that is the correct answer. Okay? So if you made it that far... Uh, you really ha do have the correct answer. But in this case now, I would try to take this one step further because the original formula did not have a negative exponent. So I want to write my uh, rate of change without a negative exponent. I want to make my rate of change formula look as close to my original formula as I can. So I want to get rid of the x to the minus 3. So how do I get rid of that? How do you uh, uh, handle negative exponents? By doing what? By taking the reciprocal. So x to the minus 3 means 1 over x cubed. So just write the x to the minus 3 as 1 over x cubed. Now, if you want to, in this case, you can multiply in the minus 10. So you get minus 10 over x cubed. So see, the, now the rate of change formula looks like 
the original formula. You know, it's not the same, of course, but it's in the same form as the original formula. All right, let's try that again. So this is about as bad as they're going to be in the homework 3.1, uh, right, okay. Wow, so suppose I have, now, you know, in practice, you know, in practice, right, you're not going to run across a function formula like this very often. So this is a very artificial example. It's made up just to help you practice differentiation rules, right, because in practice, you're not going to run across a formula like that very often. All right, 1 over 5 times the cube root. That's the cube root of x. Okay, all right, so let's see if we can, well, let's see if we can figure out how to uh, find the rate of change formula for that kind of artificial example. All right, so you've got to get it all in the correct form, right? So you don't want the radical. So how can you rewrite a cube root so that it doesn't have a radical? It's one third, that's right, yeah. Square root is one half power, so cube root is one third power. Not cube, but one third power. That's the first step. So get rid of the get rid of the radical by rewriting it as a power. Okay? So again, you thought you would never have to do that, okay? But here's where it's, you know, in practice you thought. Why would you ever rewrite a radical as a power? Here's where it's really helpful. All right. So we have 1 over 5 uh, uh, times x to the 1 third power. Now, you've got to get that x out of the denominator because I cannot apply the power rule with the x to the 1 third in the denominator of this fraction. So don't jump the gun here and apply the power rule yet. You've got to get the x to the 1 third out of the denominator. And you do that by using a negative exponent with that. So Write this as one fifth times x to the minus one third power. Don't do anything with the one fifth, okay? Right? Because the five is not raised to the one third power. It's just the x that's raised to the one third power. So you get that out of the denominator by making its exponent negative. Now you're just in perfect shape to find the rate of change formula. Oops, I put this in the wrong spot. <clears throat> Sorry, all that was preparation for finding the rate of change formula. So let me move this up. This is just the original function formula. I just rewrote it in a different form. Okay. So I took the 1 over 5 times the cube root of x and wrote that as 1 fifth times x to the minus 1 third power. Now we're going to find the rate of change formula by applying the power rule. So now, see, it's all very easy. You just apply the power rule. So what do you do with the minus 1 third? Bring it down in front. So you have minus 1 third times the 1 fifth, right, times x to hmm, the minus 1 third minus 1, OK? So I think I know what minus one third times one fifth is. That's minus one fifteenth. So that's easy. What's minus one third minus one? So if you have a negative one third and you subtract another one from it, what's that going to leave you with? Negative four thirds. So y'all y'all are going to have trouble with that arithmetic, are you? You're going to get minus four thirds. Okay. If that's causing you a problem, just take the 1 and rewrite it as thirds. 1 is 3 thirds. So you have minus 1 third minus 3 thirds. That gives you minus 4 thirds. Should I write that down? Let me put that in there. So we have minus 1 third minus 3 thirds because 1 is 3 thirds. And so that gives us minus 1 15th times x to the minus 4 thirds power. I'll be really happy now if you get to this step, okay? Because that is the correct rate of change formula, okay? So if you get right there, you've done really well, okay? 
but I'm not going to leave it right there, okay? Because this doesn't quite look like my original function look like, right? The original function had a cube root. So I want to take that 4 thirds and rewrite it as a radical. Wow, how in the world am I going to do that? So how do you take minus 4 thirds and rewrite it as a radical? Well, what's the first thing? You've got a negative. So how do you get rid of the negative exponent? What do you do? I should have you all, all do this together. Actually, actually, a master teacher told me once, you should always have your students gesture with you. Okay, right? So that's my gesture for, what am I trying to indicate there? Flip it, right. Yeah, that's flipping right, okay? Yeah, that's what we're going to do right here. Okay, so I want you to flip that x to the minus 4 thirds, right? So we're going to write that as 1 over x to the positive 4 thirds. You see, when you flip, the sign of the exponent becomes positive, okay? Don't do anything with the minus 1 15th. It's not going anywhere. It's just going to stay there, okay? So that's looking a little bit better. I don't have a negative exponent now. Okay, but now how do I write 4 thirds power as a, how do I write 4 thirds power as a radical? Okay, so x to the 4 thirds, what does that mean? Well, remember, the, it's the denominator of the fraction tells you the type of the radical. So what type of root do we have here? Cube, Cube root. And the 4 just stays as an exponent. The 4 just stays as an exponent. So you end up here with minus 1 15th, I can just squeeze this in here, times 1 over the cube root, cube root of x to the fourth power, okay? x to the four thirds means the cube root of, and then you just leave the x raised to the fourth power. I'd be really happy to get right there, okay? And then you can go ahead and multiply the minus 1 15th times this fraction, but I don't have room to put it in there. So you end up with minus 1 over 15 times the cube root of x to the fourth power. That's it. Okay. See, it kind of looks like the original formula, right? Of course, a lot more complicated, but it does look like the original formula because it has a cube root in it, right? <clears throat> Who would have thought? So the rate of change of 1 over 5 times the cube root of x is... Minus 1 15th times 1 over the cube root of x to the fourth power. Okay, hard to believe, but that's true. All right, so look, you don't, you're not going to run across uh, uh, formulas like this very often in practice. So that one is just, again, kind of an artificial example. But here's a formula that you will run across pretty frequently, okay? A formula that looks like this. So suppose we have the function x cubed plus 3x squared minus 1, okay? Wow, I would really hate to use the limit definition to try to figure out the rate of change formula for that thing, okay? But we don't have to anymore because now our differentiation rules will make that so easy. So how do you write down the rate of change? How do you indicate the rate of change? You can write y prime, or if you want to, you can write dy dx, or you can even write f prime of x. E anything like that is fine with me, okay? But what is the rate of change formula? Just go one term at a time here. This is the sum rule, okay? So the sum rule says, okay, to find the rate of change, of x cubed plus 3x squared minus 1. I'm just going to find the rate of change here. I'm going to find the rate of change here. And I'm going to find the rate of change here. I just go one term at a time. So what's the rate of change of x cubed? That's the power rule. So what's that going to be? 3x squared. See, you've already learned that. See, right? So the rate of change of x cubed is 3x squared. What's the rate of change of 3x squared? That's right. Bring the 2 down, keep the 3, subtract 1 from the exponent here. So you just have 2 times 3 times x to the first power, 6x. What's the rate of change of minus 1? 0. Ah, so that's all gone. So you just get, wow, how easy, 3x squared plus 6x.
Man, that's a time saver, isn't it? Okay, so you don't have to use that limit definition to find the rate of change formula for x cubed plus 3x squared plus 1. It's going to come out to be 3x squared plus 6x. That's it. What about this one? Also easy. So rate of change here, just go term by term. So what's the rate of change of 4x? Well, that's 4x to the first power, so you bring the 1 down, which is not going to make much difference, times 4 times x to the 1 minus 1. What about here? Bring the point 0.7 down and subtract 1 from that. So what does that first term just simplify to? Well, 1 times 4 is 4. And what's x to the 0th power? Not 0, 1. So you end up here with just 4 times 1, which is 4. Okay. So rate of change of 4x just turns out to be 4. What about this one? Well, that's going to be minus 0.7 times x to the minus 0.3. Okay. 0.7 minus 1 is minus 0.3. So let's see. Let's write this as um, 4 minus 0.7 times 1 over x to the 0.3. Because, see, x to the minus 0.3 is 1 over x to the 0.3 power, right? And so we end up there with 4 minus 0.7 over x to the 0 0.3. Does that look kind of like the original formula? Well, kind of, right? Okay. It's in the same format. So I think that would be a good place to stop. Simplifying. I've got two more examples. Let's see if we can go through them just enough time here. Okay. So what about 2 over x plus 5 over x squared? So I want to find the rate of change of that one. So that one looks impossible, right? But it's not. First, rewrite that with negative exponents. So 2 over x is going to be 2 times x to the minus 1 power. Bring the x in the denominator up and change its exponent to negative. So 2 over x is 2x to the minus 1. What about 5 over x squared? What does that look like if you want to bring the x squared up? What? 5x to the minus 2. So that's not the rate of change formula. I'm just sort of massaging the original formula, right, to get it in the right format. Now I can find the rate of change formula. So it's going to be minus 1 times 2 times x to what power? Negative 2, right. Plus, well, actually, minus 2 times 5 times x to the what power? Negative 3, right. Okay. Why did I put a minus sign there? Because when you brought that minus 2 down in front, right, you had minus 2 times the 5, and then x to the minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3. Okay. <clears throat> now, I probably would uh, uh, turn that one back to... Um, I probably would rewrite these negative exponents as positive exponents, Okay, to, again, to make the answer look like the original formula. I'll, I'll skip that step here so we can get to this last example. So what about that last example where we have h of x is, that one looks terrible, 4x to the fifth minus 3x cubed plus x squared over x squared. How in the world am I going to uh, find the rate of change there? That's a horrible function, right? Okay. Yeah, you that that would be one way to go, okay? Would that cancel out? Ah, but yeah, but here's what you want to notice. This cancels out, right? You can divide x squared into both of the uh, into all three of these terms, right? 
So that's really the, the way you want to go. So rewrite this as what's 4x to the fifth over x squared? That's 4x cubed. So you can cancel out the x squared. What's 3x squared? Uh, what's 3x cubed over x squared? 3x. And then what's x squared over x squared? Not 0. 1, right. Okay. Ah, and so now it's very easy to find the rate of change formula, right? Okay. Because now you're really just finding the rate of change of 4x cubed minus 3x plus 1. So what's the rate of change there? 12x squared. So you bring the 3 down times the 4. Subtract 1 minus 3. You see? And what's the rate of change of 1? 0. So it's going to disappear. There it is. So that looked really terrible to find the rate of change, right? But when you canceled out the x squared, it turned out to be a piece of cake. All right? Okay. Well, there are lots of examples of using these differentiation rules, and that's what you're going to be applying in the homework. Okay? So, going to use those differentiation rules. The one thing that may trip you up is trying to get the answer in the format that WebAssign wants. Okay? So, you might get the right answer, but not have it in the correct form. Think about that. Okay? Because that can. Um, that may cause you a little bit of frustration, all right? Uh, we'll turn it in next time. Yeah, I still, not everybody's here today, so we'll wait till next, uh, uh, till after spring break. Okay.